The storms may be blowing outside, but I hope as we gather here, we feel the peace and the tranquility of gathering in this place that is called sanctuary, a place of peace, a place where we gather sure and certain that we gather in the presence of God. May the Lord be with you. And also with you. Would you please stand and join me in the call to worship. In the midst of a world where cruelty abounds, we proclaim the God of compassion. In the midst of despair that threatens to claim us, we come to remember that God is our hope. In the midst of indifference and apathy, we celebrate the God who cares. In the midst of the hate and the violence, we will pass to our faith in God who is love. Come, let us worship God. Let us pray. All people that dwell on earth are God's people. God, we are yours. We are the work of your hands. It is you who breathes life and breath into us. And through all our days, you are the one who sustains us. And so you, God, are the one who is worthy of our praise and our thanksgiving, of the worship of our lips and of our lives. So, God, we gather here to worship you. Whoever we are, whatever we have done or failed to do, wherever we have come from, we gather here mindful that we are one family and you are our God, mother and father to us all. God, we offer you our worship and our praise and pray that in this time of worship, you may touch and bless our lives, that your word may speak into our lives to guide us, to uphold us, to refresh us and to renew us. So, God, meet with us here this day and bless this time of worship that we share together. And all of God's people said, Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. And a very warm welcome into the house of God. And especially warm welcome is extended to you if you are visiting with us this morning. 
we bid you a warm welcome and ask you to sign the blue visitors books at the end of each pew and we also invite you to join us for further fellowship through in Airman Hall following morning worship there will be uh, tea and coffee and juice and also cookies so do come and join us for cookies as I point over here I draw your attention to these beautiful flowers that are decorating the sanctuary this morning these flowers are given in memory of the late Bob Bueller, whose family are with us this morning. We bid you a very warm welcome. We know that this is the one year anniversary of your father's death. And we hope that as you worship here with us, you feel something of God's peace and love surrounding you. There are a number of other announcements in the bulletin. There's lots of things going on. I draw your attention to um, page number 10. And this is a fundraiser for the Healthcare Network turning 30 years old. Please do um, look at this item and article if you're able to help in any way, please do so. I noticed that there is a minute for mission printed in the bulletin. I wonder if someone is, is going to do that or is that me? Georgia, thank you. Probably best to use the pulpit mic as I think uh, it's fine. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. The mission committee has met recently and we have organized a couple of upcoming events. The first one that I'd like to call your attention to is the fundraiser next Saturday, October 22nd. We are going to be selling apples that are donated by the Borzinski family, and we are hoping to raise some funds for the Puerto Rico Hurricane Relief Fund associated with the Milwaukee Presbytery. Then we are also going to be participating in a trunk or treat, and I believe that's on October 29th um, after uh, service. I think the hours are like one to four before most of the trick-or-treats throughout the county. And we're asking people to come and decorate their trunks and celebrate that autumnal activity with some of the young people in the neighborhood and the young people within our congregation. We're asking you to donate treats, obviously candy, but also to donate school supplies because through our um, food pantry, we recognize that there's a continuing need for school supplies throughout, for children throughout our neighborhood. So we'll ho we hope that you'll keep those events in mind. And as always, we thank you for your commitment to the mission work that our congregation is continually committed to achieving. Thank you. Good morning. Whenever I do the call to confession, I always have a thought or two, as you probably remember. And I thought to myself, you know when we confess, usually we're by ourselves, quiet, maybe worried about something, maybe praying for somebody. But how different this is. This is our family of God right here. And as we do our confession, we have our family all around us. And I think that's so powerful that when we pray, we are one group, even though we individually pray our own confession. So would you please join me in our prayer to confession? Creator God, you have entrusted to us this beautiful earth. When we have neglected it, and abused it, forgive us. God of all peoples, you have commanded us to love without limit. Forgive us when we have been cold and indifferent to the plight of our sisters and brothers. God, in whom we place our faith, forgive us when we have not lived as faithfully and mindfully as you have intended. Through your mercy and forgiveness, grant us peace and the promise of new beginnings. Teach us to live with open hearts and with tender compassion for the world and for all who live here. Amen.
Friends, hear the good news of our gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Please be seated. And let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for this wonderful, amazing world and for the very gift of life too often taken for granted. We thank you for this special time set aside from all other time to gather as your people in worship to seek and to receive your forgiveness, to spend time in the company of the faithful, and to ponder your word and to offer you our prayers. So God, hear our prayers and into our lives with, with, with whatever we bring to worship today, speak a word in season a word that will inspire us and guide us and strengthen us and give us courage for the journey that is our lives, the journey that we take with you, our God. Amen. Hands up if you've ever been in my office. Hands down. What, when you're in my office, do you see? I knew that people would say candy. I know that that's the only reason that people come into my office. Hands up if you come into my office for candy, Pat Reitzma. <laughs> Hands up if you've ever had candy in my office. Okay, let's put the candy aside. Apart from candy, what else do you see in my office? Books. Hands up if you've seen the books. There are lots of books. One day, I'll get to read them. <laughs> what else? Evelyn, you said something. Stuffed animals. Hands up if you've seen the stuffed animals. Yeah, there are a lot. Of, have you seen the stuffed animals, Calliope and Morgan? Yeah, I know. What else have you seen in my office? A picture that isn't hung up. <laughs> so I bought a picture a year ago in August, yes, you heard me right. I, heard a, I bought a picture a year ago in August at the Chapel Art Show, and it's still not hung up. I'm just beginning to think that it looks really nice where it is. Thank you, John. <laughs> so there is a picture that's not hung up. What else have you seen in my office? Sorry? Oh, me. Yes, sometimes I'm there. Yes, sometimes I'm there. That's right. What else? Chairs, mm -hmm. chairs, table. Steve, my computer. Mm -hmm. Have any of you, so, so most of the things in my office, apart from you know, the chair and things like that, and the desk and the books, so apart from all of these things, most of the things in my office I have used in some shape or form to give a message during this time in worship. Yeah? So I've got a whole collection of different things. But I wonder if any of you have noticed that in my office, I have this. <coughs> Hands up. <laughs> Hands up if you've ever noticed this. No, have you noticed the girls? Yeah. Not only do I have one of these, my goodness. I have two. Does anyone know why I have two 
bricks in my office. Doorstop? That's, that, that's actually a really good guess. Yeah. Anyone else? Sorry? Do you know, Dave, I have got no idea what it is. Really? Metropolitan block. Do you hear that? That's from the street right out here. <gasps> it's a hundred or more years old. <gasps> Hands up. <laughs> I'll not complete that sentence. So, so here's the thing, boys and girls. I have absolutely no idea why there was a brick in my office, why there were two bricks in my office. But now I know. But you see, I was thinking about these, these bricks. And I was thinking about how so many things in my office I use to try and get a message across to you. And when I was thinking about this, this brick or this stone or whatever you want to call it, I was thinking, there's a message in this brick. And it's not a message about College Avenue and it's not a message about what happened 100 years ago. That is very interesting, though. This is a message about Jesus. And you say, really? Jesus and a brick? Well, in actual fact, Jesus said that he referred to himself as a stone. A stone's a brick. And Jesus said, I am the cornerstone of your life. Now, I want you to think about this building and think about all the bricks and all the stones that were put together. And the cornerstone is the one right down in the corner. And what Jesus is saying is if you take that cornerstone away, then really things start to crumble. But Jesus is saying, you know, I want you to build your life on me. To use me as the cornerstone of your life. To use me as the one on whom you're going to build your life and the way you live. Because the cornerstone is the most important stone. I doubt that this was a cornerstone. But this is solid. This is solid. And what Jesus is saying is, build your life on something solid, on something strong. Jesus knew that many people were going to reject him. But he said, you, all of you, you build your life on something strong and solid, on the cornerstone, on me. Build your life on my teaching. Build your life on my teaching that says, and I mean it, love one another. Build your life on my teaching that says, when someone does you wrong, forgive them. When someone is unkind to you, you be kind in return. Build your life on me, says Jesus, because I am strong and I am steady and I am secure and my teaching is a good thing for you to build your life on because it will sustain you through all of your life. There are many people in our world today, and Jesus predicted this would happen, who reject the way of Jesus. Personally, I think that's why we're in the mess that we're in. Jesus says, build your life on me. And right at the very heart of Jesus' teaching is this. Love one another as I have loved you. And I think if we build our lives on that, then we build well for ourselves and for the world. Amen. Everyone knows that um, Charlie Brown has a dog whose name is Snoopy. And what is, what's one of the things that Snoopy does? Something 
Mr. Lively. He plays around. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute, I can't hear this. What does Snoopy do? Oh, does he? Snoopy walks with the kids to school. That sounds like a plan to me, to have someone to walk to school with, and who better than a dog? As cute as Snoopy. <laughs> Snoopy, to, Morgan said, Snoopy licks the little girl in the face, and she says, I've been kissed by a dog. I actually think dog kisses are the best kisses ever. <laughs> Evelyn. He can play the guitar. Hands up if you knew that Snoopy could play the guitar. I did not know that. Wow. Logan, what else does Snoopy do? He's a very clever dog. Taylor. He does. He does a lot of just laying on top of his dog house. Hence the name, it's a dog's life. Hey, that would be nice just to lie around all day. Evelyn. He can fly a plane. Do you know what he's called when he flies a plane? The Red Barrier. You're really good at this. You really need to get out more often. <laughs> Megan. He decorates his house at Christmas. These are all great answers, Victoria. He makes toast and popcorn for Thanksgiving. I'm coming to his house for Thanksgiving. No pumpkin pie. Evelyn. For Easter, he becomes the Easter beagle and he delivers eggs for everybody. These are just great answers and I didn't know any of this. <laughs> and these are not the answers that I'm looking for. <laughs> Snoopy is a writer. Yeah! Oh, you all remember now. So Snoopy is a writer, and often you see the cartoon strip where Snoopy is sitting on top of his, his house with a typewriter, hard at work. And there's a cartoon strip where Snoopy is, is working away, and Charlie comes over, and Charlie says to him, what are you doing, Snoopy? And Snoopy says, I am writing a book on theology. Charlie Brown is like, really? Yes, said Snoopy. I am writing a book on theology. And Charlie says, well, Snoopy, any book on theology has to have a really good title. Do you have a good title, Snoopy? Snoopy says, I've got the best title. What is it, says Charlie? Snoopy says, has it ever occurred to you, you might be wrong? Mm. See, when it comes to our faith, we don't like to think that we're wrong. We like to think we're in the know. We like to think that we have the answers. We know better than them. That somehow we've got this direct line with God. Has it ever occurred to us that we might be wrong? I think that's a great title for a book on theology. Has it ever occurred to us we might be wrong? None of us really like to be wrong. And we certainly don't like to be proven wrong. I know that there's, there's a story about an argument between a husband and wife. And at the end of the argument, the wife tries to sum it up by saying, listen, I'll admit I was wrong if you admit I was right. <laughs> we like to be right. Don't say that's your mother, Evelyn. I heard that. <laughs> so we do like to think that we're right. And when it comes to our faith, we like to think that we have it all signed, sealed, and delivered. We know. And we're right. The thing is that there were people in Jesus' day who thought that they were right. And we heard a little bit about them last week and the week before, the chief priests and the Pharisees. They thought that they had it signed, sealed, and delivered, that they knew best. But then along comes Jesus. And Jesus says, you know, you people who think you've got it right, has it ever occurred to you that you might be wrong? Because you are. 
Jesus comes along and in this parable that we're going to read from Matthew's gospel, he really is saying to the Pharisees and the chief priests and the scribes and all those people who thought that they were right and that they were holier than thou, he says to them, you know, you've got it wrong. You really have got it wrong. You think that all of this is yours. You think that you own all of this. You think that you know everything. And what he's saying to them is really, you know, all of this is just given by God on loan. All of this is gift. All that you have is just gift. Jesus tells a parable, and the parable is about the owner of the vineyard and the tenants who are looking after the vineyard. So in, in short, owner of a vineyard builds a vineyard, builds a watchtower, and goes away to another country, but has people to come and look after the vineyard. God made a world, and God then invites us to be stewards of that world. That's, that's what the story is about. And then God, the owner of the vineyard, comes and says, what I would like is I would like you to give me back something. I'm not asking for it all. I'm just asking for a little something. And the tenants say, no. Not only do they say no, but they run the prophets, they run the, the, the people who come to get the money, they run them out of the vineyard, and eventually they even kill the son. That would be Jesus. And Jesus finishes this parable by saying that really the stone that everyone rejected, the son that everyone rejected, is really, should be really the foundation stone of your life and the life of the world, the vineyard, whatever you want to call it. And you might say, well, this story has absolutely nothing to say to us today. Well, I beg to differ. God has given us this wonderful, amazing planet, this earth and all its richness and in all its variety. And God asks us to give just a little bit back, just a little bit. And we say, no, I think it's all ours. I think in many ways what we see is that the Son, Jesus Christ, has been rejected by earth today, by its inhabitants. We've rejected the way of Jesus Christ. We've not built our lives on Jesus Christ. We've rejected his way, and that's why we're kind of in the mess that we're in, is it not? There's a story told of a husband and wife who were both acting in the church play. And the church play was based on Genesis 1. And the husband had to be Adam. And the woman was to be the voice of God. And during one of the rehearsals, the pastor was listening as the man playing Adam went on and on and on and on. And the pastor said, wait a minute you're not God. And his wife said, I've been telling him that for years. <laughs> we sometimes have acted as little gods, believing that what we have is ours, believing that we're in charge and that we're right. When in actual fact, we're not in charge. We're not always right. And all that we have, everything, is gift. It's on loan to us. It's God's gift to us. Let us hear the word of God in Matthew chapter 21. We're reading from verse 33. Listen to another parable, said Jesus. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. And when the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. And finally, he sent his son to them saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. 
So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They, the chief priests and Pharisees, said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death, and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give them the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them, and they wanted to arrest him. But they feared the crowds, because they regarded him as a prophet. Amen, and thanks be to God. They say that people get up in the morning and they receive the morning in two different ways. I wonder which one, which category you fall into. They wake up and say, good morning, Lord. Or they say, good Lord, it's morning. <laughs> How do you welcome the day? You know, there's a story told about Benjamin Franklin. And Benjamin Franklin is quoted as saying, I wake up and I immediately grab the newspaper. I go to the obituary page and I look to see if my name is there. And if it is not, I rise and get on with the day. How do you get up in the morning? Do you get up wearily? Do you get up gladly? Do you embrace the day? Are you one of these people who hit the ground running? Or are you like me, like the tortoise, slow and steady? I have to have my routine. And just for the record, I have to have my coffee. <laughs> Hands up who has to have their coffee in the morning. Oh, yeah. It gets you going, doesn't it? How do you greet the day? So really what I want to ask you is, how do you face the day? How do you face the day when it comes to thinking about what your purpose is? Do you just get up and face the day by just doing the same old thing? You go through the same routine and you think of all the things that you need to get done because undoubtedly there's a whole list of things. But do you ever, do you ever get up and say, what is the purpose of my life today? That's a way, way deeper question. Most of us actually prefer to avoid that question because actually that question really hits hard in our lives. Science has told us how we got to be here. And I believe how science has told us how we got to be here. But why are you here? Why are you on this earth? What is your purpose in any given day? Do you ever ask yourself that question? What is your purpose? Why are you here? I think Jesus invites us to consider that question, why are we here? We are here because of God's free gift of life. And God has given to us this wonderful planet, this gift that is ours, and it's on loan to us. And we see the effects of what happens when we abuse that planet. We see tsunamis and wildfires, and we see earthquakes, and we see hurricanes, and we see famines, and we see all sorts of things. But we think that this life is ours. It's ours to do with as we please. 
It's ours to do with the world as we please. It's ours to do with life as we please. But I think this parable of the talents actually really asks something deeper. What are you going to do with this life? And what are you going to give back to God? Notice that the, the vineyard owner doesn't want everything. The vineyard owner doesn't want it all back. It's just, what are you going to give back from your life to the one who has given you everything? Absolutely everything. What are you going to give back? Are you going to build your life on the teaching of Jesus Christ? Because Jesus says that most people reject his teaching. And yet those who build their lives on the teaching of Christ build their lives on a teaching of love and of peace and of kindness and of forgiveness. And my word, does our world need that now? What are you going to give back to God? There's a story told of a man who um, was, was at church one day, and this man was known in this congregation to be extremely wealthy, probably a billionaire. And some people, it was stewardship season, and some people were invited to tell their story, their faith story, and this man stood up, and he said, I'd like to tell my story about how I came to faith in God. And he said, this story goes back many, many years. And I turned up at this church one evening, and there was an evening service going on, and I had one dollar in my pocket. It was all that I owned. I had one dollar. And as I sat and listened that evening, there was a guest visitor, a missionary from overseas, and at the end of her speaking, an offering was taken up. And as the offering plate came to me, I realized I only had one dollar. And I knew that if I put the dollar in, it really wouldn't be right to take change. <laughs> and so I knew that it was all or nothing. With that one dollar and the offering plate coming closer and closer, I thought, what am I going to give to God? And he said, you know, I knew that it was all or nothing, and so I gave all that I had to God. I put the dollar in the offering plate, and I believe that because I gave everything to God, God has blessed me and made me wealthy. And he sat down, and this lady, two rows in front, turned around and said, I dare you to do it again. <laughs> you know, when we set out, we think, I'm going to give everything that I have. I'm going to give it all. Then something happens in life and we think like these tenants in the vineyard that really, actually, <laughs> it's all ours. It's all ours, all that we have. We pride ourselves in our rugged individualism. We pride ourselves in we're self-made. We pride ourselves in this is our world. Well, it's not. It's God's. And everything that we have and all that we are is a gift. And this parable says, what are you going to give back? What are you going to give back? We are coming up to stewardship season, and I am going to invite you to think about what you are going to give back. But today, I ask you, what of yourself are you going to give back? God wants the fruits of the vineyard. God wants the fruits of our life, of what we are going to do for God, what can we give? How can we give? How can we give something back to God to change this world for the better? The greatest gift we have is ourselves, our lives. Anthony de Mello is a mystic and a writer, and he tells of a time when he went to Africa to a country that was ravaged by famine. And he went to some of the villages in that country and he speaks of a moment in time when he was standing watching this community full of people who were emaciated with starvation. And you know how sometimes someone just catches your eye, there's just someone that, that you connect with? And Anthony de Mello connected with this little boy, a tiny little boy, he didn't have a pick on him. 
emaciated with hunger. And Anthony said, our eyes met with each other eye to eye and we looked into each other's souls and I could stand it no longer and I turned away and I said, dear God, what are you going to do about this? And Anthony said in the silence, it was as clear as day. Anthony, I did do something. I made you. I made you. Each of us have it within our power to give something back to God by serving our fellow men and women and children, by offering back to the God who has given us everything, and I mean everything, to give back something in his service so that we turn our prayers into action and build our lives on the teaching of Jesus Christ. Amen. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Our children leave for Sunday school and confirmation, and I invite you to exchange the peace with each other. Peace be with you. I need a gavel. We sing our song of response from the bulletin. It's on page number six, and it reminds us that God is a God of every blessing, great God of every blessing.
before we uplift the offering, um, I'd like to thank Mark and, and especially Roberta. This is Roberta's first time and hopefully not the last time playing publicly. I think she did a great job. <laughs> Would the ushers please uplift the offering? Please be seated. We turn to God with our prayers this morning. I draw your attention to the prayers that are printed in the bulletin and to them we add our own prayers for our world, for one another. We pray to God with open hearts and open minds. We pray to God 
asking that God's will be done. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for the beautiful melody that Alejandro has played, reminding us of the beauty of this earth, its beauty, its wonder, its fragility. Thank you, God, that you have given us this earth to enjoy, but also to take care of. God, help us to take care of this world. Help us to treasure it. Help us not to abuse it or desecrate it or destroy it, but to care for it, remembering that it is your creation and that it is here for our enjoyment and our pleasure, but that it, also, that it is also for the pleasure of those who would come after us. Keep us mindful of this fact. God, help us to care for the world and her inhabitants. You know, God, that this world is deeply troubled and that people are suffering, suffering the effects of wildfires, hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, diseases, death, mindless gun violence, suffering at the hands of hatred and all the isms that we could ever imagine. God, help us to care, to care for others, whether they be friend or stranger, whether they be like us or different. Help us to embrace the diversity that you have created and to see that in our difference lies our glory and our joy. God, we pray for healing, for healing for broken hearts and broken lives and broken minds, for healing for communities ravaged by war, civil or otherwise. We pray, God, for this world and her people. We pray for one another as we each travel through life, sometimes weary and tired by what we see happening. Keep us strong and faithful. Keep us trusting in you that you still love this world and care for it. And invite us to be your partners in caring for it and one another. Turn our prayers into actions that we may transform lives for the better. Hear our prayer. And hear us now as we say the prayer that Jesus taught us, uniting ourselves with one another and with your church in heaven and on earth, saying these words, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
into the world with your hearts full of gratitude for the wonder and the beauty of this world given to us by God and the wonder and the beauty of human life and those with whom we share it. Go forth into the world to offer yourselves in God's service. And as you go, may the blessings of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and rest and remain with you, with those whom you love in this life and the next, and with all God's people everywhere. May these blessings be upon you today, tomorrow, and forevermore. And all of God's people said, Jesus Christ be with you all.